you know, God has always been faithful. Where, who can say God is faithful to me? Okay, God is faithful to me. You know, we, the, God's faithfulness is not measured by how much He meets our expectations. Okay? Because sometimes God doesn't meet our expectations. And the reason why He doesn't meet our expectations is because there are times He has better things for us than what we expect. And that's why we need to be faithful in th giving thanks to God even when things don't turn out the way we expect. Because God has something better for us. Do you recognize that? Amen? So how many of you have had some disappointments this week? Okay, real disappointments this week. Okay? Well, we live in a, in a, we live in a world that's not perfect. Amen? We live with people who are not perfect. Okay? We do not have always control over our circumstances. That's why, because we are not always in full control, things will happen against our expectations. But when you see God, as we have been looking at the life of Joshua, when you see God behind everything, you begin to recognize that there must be a good purpose of my Father. Amen? Maybe as my Father has something better for me than what I really wanted or expected. And I'm going to trust my Father who knows what is best for me. Can we say that together? I'm going to trust my Father who knows what is best for me, even when my expectations are not fulfilled. Amen? We've been going through the story of Joshua, and today we're going to focus on the third part of the series, which is the commissioning of Joshua. Okay, how many of you have learned much from our Joshua series in terms of, amen, praise the Lord. You know, not all of us may be in a position of leadership because this is a leadership series. Not all of us may be in a position of leadership, but listen to this. Leadership is not about position. It's about influence. Like every day you influence people around you by the way you talk, the way you behave. Okay? When you wake up in the morning and you're grumpy, everybody in the family will feel your grumpiness and they may end up being grumpy too. Do you understand that? If you cross the street, you know, when there, when there is no pedestrian lane and you, you jaywalk, you will influence somebody to follow you too. Okay? Have you experienced that? You tend to have followers from time to time. Okay? So, your attitude, your way of life, your conduct affects people every day and they ex exert a level of influence on people every day. That is why John Maxwell said, leadership is not about position, it's about influence. Yeah, in his book, by Bringing Out the Leader Within You, he's emphasizing that every person has leadership influence wherever you are. But John Maxwell was not the first one to say that. It was Jesus Christ who first said that. Right? In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Okay? Nor the people light a lamp and place it under the table. But you place it where everybody can see it. So let your light shine among men that they may see your good works and bring glory to your Father in heaven. Do you understand this? To say to the person beside you, whether you like it or not, you are God's influence wherever you are. And people are watching you. And God is watching too. Do you understand this? So you have to accept the fact that when you become a follower of Christ, you're not an ordinary person anymore. You are God's light. Can you say that to the person beside you? You're not an ordinary person. You are the light of God in this world. And it matters to God how you live every day. It matters to God what comes out of your mouth every day. Because our actions and our words influence people every day. From your home to your workplace, if you're a student in your school, among your barcada, your colleagues, everything they see in you, in your words and actions, can influence them. Do you understand this? That's why can you say to the person inside, you have the power to influence minds around you. Amen? Okay. You have that power every day. Okay? Because not many people in our society live by conviction. People who live by conviction are not influenced by anybody else because they know what they believe in, they know where they stand, and they know what to do. 
Because they are men and women of conviction. So they just follow the crowd. They just follow somebody else. But most people in our society are not like that. Most people in our society are easily influenced by what they see or hear around them. Even in the news, you know, in their reading materials, in their conversations with people. People are easily influenced. Because we are a culture who have not really been uh, brought up to develop strong convictions. Why? Because of the common absence of a father in the home. It is the father that must build convictions in his children. But if the father has no convictions in life, there is nothing in the impart to the next generation. Do you understand this? That is why there are so many men in our society who are not able to rise up to genuine leadership in their families, in their marriages, and even where God has positioned them because they lack those convictions that they need upon which they will build their leadership. You cannot be a leader if you have no convictions on which you will stand. Do you understand that? You'll be easily swayed by people, circumstances, and even experiences that you will go through, negative or positive, you will be easily influenced. That is why we cannot fully obey God when we are not living our lives on the basis of God-given convictions. Do you understand this? Okay? Because that is our society, you can influence them easily. Do you understand that? Because they're always looking for somebody or things around them that will make them believe this is the right thing to do. Right? Like jaywalking along the street. Because no, there's no policeman anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> because it's so you jaywalking. Amen? Now, we know one day God will render us accountable for our words and our deeds. Our, how we live our life will be accountable to God one day. And if our lives has become a stumbling block to others around us, a stumbling block means somebody who causes or leads others to sin because of their wrong model or example. So they have the wrong example and influence others to follow the wrong example. That is what Jesus meant by becoming a stumbling block to others. Okay? But the great concern of the New Testament is that we don't become a stumbling block to fellow believers, especially. Especially to those who are just new in the faith. Because God wants them to be influenced rightly so they grow in holiness and righteousness as God expects us all to be. Amen? So do you recognize that you are exerting influence every day? Wherever you are, in your home first of all, okay? So, the message about Joshua applies to all of us, okay? And so today, we're going to take a look at the commissioning of Joshua. And you're going to turn our Bibles to Numbers chapter 27, verse 12 to 22. We'll read this for a while as our major main text, and then we'll move to other scriptures today. The commissioning of Joshua. Okay, can we show the slide? Okay, let's go to the verse first. Numbers 27, 12 to 22. Okay? If you have your Bibles with you, please join us. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go up this mountain in the Abarim range and see the land I have given the Israelites. After you have seen it, you too will be gathered to your people as your brother Aaron was. Listen to this. For when the community rebelled at the waters in the desert of Zin, both of you disobeyed my command. To honor me as holy before their eyes. These were the waters of Meribah and Kadesh in the desert of Zin. What was the sin of Moses that disqualified him from entering the promised land? He, st he struck the rock twice instead of speaking to the rock as God commanded. Let's go to the next scripture. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community. You see, the heart of Moses really was with the people. He was concerned that if the Lord takes him on home, he dies, who's going to lead these people? I mean, all his 40 years of leading these people will be put to nothing if they are not able to enter the land and possess it. But for them to enter the land and possess it, they need a leader. And because God said, I'm going to take you home because of what you have done. You can no longer enter the land, but you will see the land with your eyes, but you will not enter it anymore. Okay? And so... He said, appoint someone over this community, next verse, to go out and come in before them, and who will lead them out and bring them in, so that the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. 
Can you see the heart of Moses for these people? These people has caused him countless headaches and heartaches for the last 40 years. Did you hear that? Their constant complaining has caused God to be angry at them and twice God threatened to completely destroy them and that Moses intervened and interceded, that plan of God would have been executed. Do you understand that? I mean, that would be great news for Moses. Okay, God, if you want to destroy these people, go ahead. Because finally, I can have my break <laughs> with these people. But what is so, you know, what's so significant about Moses is that even though he has gone through so many heartaches with his people, and has played like a referee between God and Israel so many times, when God was about to destroy these people because of their stubbornness and constant bickering and club complaints, he was always trying to keep them from killing each other. Do you understand that? That is so tiring, right? And yet, in spite of that, he said, Somebody has to take care of them, Lord. If you're going to take me home, you need someone to take care of them. So that they will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. You know, this is the heart of Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, when he saw these multitudes, whom they left in another place, and later on when they tried to go to another place to rest, you know, that entire multitude ran across the land, the coast, the coast, and when they arrived at the other side, the same crowd was there waiting for them. <laughs> I mean, the people would not give Jesus a break. But when Jesus saw the multitudes, instead, his disciples were already irritated. I mean, we left these people back there, took this boat and go to this land, so that, as you said, Lord, so that we can rest. But these people would not allow us to rest. They, they don't know, they really made a, how many, how many meters dash? I think there's more than a number of kilometers that they had to run just to be exactly where Jesus' boat will dock. And so the disciples saw these people. Those are the same people we left back there. <laughs> but what does the Word of God say? When Jesus saw the crowds, he felt compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. These people were wearying him out. But he said, no, I will still teach to them. Because they're like sheep without a shepherd. Their hunger, the fact that they ran this many kilometers just to be here, show that they're so hungry for God. And I just cannot turn that away. You understand that? The same heart is the heart of Moses. God is saying, Moses, you're finally going to get the break you've been looking for. I'm going to take you home. Okay? So you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to suffer with these people who's constantly complaining against me and rebelling against me. So, now your prayer is answered. <laughs> you're going home and you're going to rest. Right? But when Moses say yes, Lord, appoint someone to take care of them. Okay? And so, let's go on reading. So, how did God respond? So, the Lord said to Moses, Take Joshua, son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit of leadership. Now, the word leadership is not in the Hebrew. It is added by the translators. The word that is there is only spirit. In whom is the spirit. Okay? The word spirit there in Hebrew is the Hebrew word ruach, which also means breath. It also means wind. They understand that. So it can be translated spirit, wind, or breath. But in this context, obviously, it's not in whom is the wind. Obviously not the wind. In whom is the breath. Well, obviously not the breath. In whom is the spirit. Now the spirit can refer to the Holy Spirit, and refer to, or can refer to a gift that the Holy Spirit gives to the person. Okay? The NIV 2011 version, which is our translation right here, chooses to see the word spirit there as representing one of the gifts. And they specified the gift of leadership. Again, that is not in the original Hebrew. Okay? So, but I believe they are right. It's either in whom is the Spirit of God, just like the Spirit of God was in Moses, 
The same Joshua also had the Spirit of God in him. But it also meant that the Spirit that gives him the gift of leadership is within him. So specifically, the Spirit of leadership. Do you understand this? So in other words, God qualified Joshua for the job. Do you understand that? Where did the Spirit come from? From God. Listen to this. God does not call the qualified. You always hear this. He qualifies those whom He calls. I'm not qualified for that. Okay, and you know God is calling you, right? But Lord, I don't feel qualified for your calling. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the one He calls. Your job is just to obey God and God will build in you what you need in order to succeed His calling for your life. You understand that? That is why the key is obedience. Let God deal with what you need because that is part of the work. That is part of the call. Let God deal with the results so long as you're obedient to God because that is part of God's responsibility, not yours. Your only responsibility is to obey God and do it well by the grace of God. Do you understand this? And so he said, In whom is the spirit of leadership which God placed in Joshua to qualify him for this calling and lay your hand on him. You know what the laying of hand means? In ancient times, the laying of hand means a transfer of identity or a transfer of authority. Can we say that together? Transfer of identity or transfer of authority. So when Moses, uh, when Moses laid his, was to lay his hands on him, the authority that God has given Moses will be transferred to him. Do you understand that? And his identity as the deliverer of Israel, the leader of Israel, will now be transferred to Joshua. You call that an impartation. Do you understand that? We'll talk more about impartation later. And so, lay your hand upon him. Next verse. Have him stand before Ezar the priest and the entire assembly and commission him in their presence. The priest is the one who anoints. Okay? There was to carry the oil from the temple, the sanctuary, but here in the tabernacle in the wilderness. And there was the anoint, the one that God has called. Now, there are only three callings that is anointed by the oil, by the priests. Okay? The office of the king, the office of the priest, and the office of a prophet. Now, which one does Joshua qualify in? King, prophet, and priest. Obviously not a priest. Obviously it's not a prophet. He must be a king or a leader of the people. So the anointing must be done. Next verse. Give him some of your authority so the whole Israelite community will obey him. Now this is important when it comes to transfer of authority. You have to let the people recognize that this person has been given authority so they will recognize it and submit to his leadership. Okay? That's why we have induction of officers, induction of leaders. We should declare to the community that they have been given authority by the leadership and therefore God's people are expected to submit to them and their authority. Next verse. He is to send before Elzar the priest who will obtain decisions for him by inquiring of Urim before the Lord. At his command, he and the entire community of the Israelites will go out and at his command, they will come in. That is the authority that Moses wants to give to Joshua. That when they leave, he, they will follow him. When they come into the land, they will also follow him. Okay? Next verse. Moses did as the Lord commanded. He took Joshua and had him stand before Eleazar the priest and the whole assembly. So that's the story. Deuteronomy chapter 3 verse 23 to 28 tells us the background of this story. Now why did God say to Moses, choose Joshua and anoint him as a leader. Why did he say this? Take a look at what Moses said in Deuteronomy 3, verse 23. Okay, and you will see here how, how Moses used his ministry of intercession. God has heard him before when he interceded for Israel many times. When God wanted to destroy them, he interceded and God heard him. But this prayer request was not granted. This one. At the time, I pleaded with the Lord. So he was pleading with God. He had pleaded for Israel before to avoid their destruction. 
This time he's pleading for himself. Okay? If God heard Moses in his pleading on behalf of Israel, whom God said, I will destroy them, shouldn't God hear Moses pleading for his own request? Do you agree? Okay, look at this. He prayed to God, Sovereign Lord, you have begun to show to your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do the deed, mighty works you do. You're, when you're about to ask God for something really challenging, something that you know God may not give you, something that you may have doubts about, if you want to get the heart of God to listen to you, start by affirming God for who He is. I'll tell you the secret to the heart of God. That's why when Jesus commanded us to pray to the Father, what was the prayer He taught us? Father, what's the first thing you say? Oh, so let's recite the Our Father. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. May your name be set apart as holy. May your name be honored above all creation. That's what it means to be hallowed. You start with affirming God by praising Him for who He is. Do you understand that? And then talk about His interest. Your kingdom come, not my bread be given first. You don't start by asking for your personal needs. You ask first that God will fulfill His purpose. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven because that's the interest of God. You talk to God in terms of who He is and His interests. When you do that, you get the hearing of God. You understand this? That's also true in human relationships. When you want to talk to someone who may be sensitive about the topic of your discussion, especially your spouse, <laughs> who are married here. Oh. Or maybe your leader, okay, he has been quite hard on you, and you're struggling. Or maybe for students, who are students here. Maybe the teacher who is just overbearing on you. Okay, for those students, how many of you have teachers really is little like uh, that's too much for you very good you should be thankful you came here today you're gonna learn something <laughs> when you're approaching someone to request something and you know it might be a challenging you know discussion how do you begin find what you can affirm first in the person and talk about the person's interest okay can we go back to the scripture Talk about the person's interest. That you agree with him in his interest. Like for a student. Mom, I know you, have, you really want us to be very good students. And I appreciate that. Okay? Mom, I understand your intention is to bring out the best in us. And I appreciate that. Okay? You have begun to show to your servant your great and strong hand for what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do the deeds and mighty works you do. Lord, I'm all for you. you you're awesome. But remember, this is sincere because God can see your heart. Hindi <laughs> yung parang uh, you're just flattering God or you know, trying to make Him look good even though in your heart you're doubting Him. <laughs> you can see your heart. So start with affirming God. Look at the next verse. And then comes the request, right? Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done earth in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. That comes last. Okay? I'm teaching you how to talk to God. To ensure you get a hearing from God. Do you understand this? Now comes the request. God already said, you will not enter the land. Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country and Lebanon. Next verse. But because of you, <laughs> the stubbornness of the people that led God to give, bring them water from the rock again, he said, he, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. This is the first time that God did not listen to me. Every time I prayed for you and pleaded to God that he will not destroy you when you were rebelling against him, that happened twice. I laid my life for you. 
God heard me. But this is the first time that God said, No! Okay? That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me anymore about this matter. Ouch! Well, even affirming God did not work, at least, at that point. <laughs> But you know how Moses won the heart of God the last time that he pleaded for Israel? Go to Exodus 33. So you understand that. You know how to deal with God. In Exodus chapter 33, God said to Moses, I will no longer go with you. Lead these people, okay, whom you brought out of Egypt. But I won't go with you anymore. I'm done with these people. Because if I go with you, I may just destroy them along the way. Okay, let's take a look at Exodus 33. And verse 1 up to verse 3. Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. You see, notice, uh, you and all the people that you brought up out of Egypt. Is that what God said in Exodus 20 in the Ten Commandments? He said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I am the one who brought you out. This time he changed the pronoun. Who you brought out of the land of Egypt. God was beginning to disown his people because in chapter 32, the chapter preceding this, was the golden calf episode. That's when the Israelites, you know, made a golden calf and worshipped that in direct disobedience to God's second command. You shall have no other gods before me. Do you understand this? And God said to Moses, let me destroy these people. Do you understand it? And Moses said, no, Lord, please. Okay? And so, he said, leave this place, you and the people that you brought up out of Egypt, and go to the land I promised an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you. He only says, I, pagdating doon sa mga patriarchs to whom he gave their promise. But to them, the people you brought out. Next verse. I will send an angel before you and drive all the Canaanites, Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites, all the parasites in the land. Next verse. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these words, distressing words, they began to mourn. Rightly so, they insulted God, okay? And no one put on their ornaments, okay? So, how did Moses move? Look at verse 11 and following. Moses now moves into action. But the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young age, Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. That was the tent of meeting. Can you look at verse 7? Just one verse. This is the background of the tent. So after God said to Moses, I won't go with you anymore. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. You know what's a tent of meeting? There's a tent where he meets with God. Is there appointment place with God. That's where he talks to God. The tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp. Those who want to talk directly to God can go to the tent and talk to God. The problem is, because of God's anger, people were so scared, nobody went to the tent. Except two, Moses and the other one is Joshua. Only those two went into the tent. Now let's go to verse 12. Now Moses moves to plead for the people. You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. Okay, God, okay, fine. You said you're not going with us anymore. And now you're telling me, I lead these people into the land. But you have not told me who will go with me. Lord, you have always been my friend. And now you're saying, Goodbye, my friend. Go do your job. I won't be with you anymore. Right? And he said, well, you know, God, I'm so used to having a friend like you. <laughs> and uh, you have not told me who will take your place in my life as a leader. I need somebody to be with me. I need somebody to mentor me. I need somebody to guide me. And that's you, oh God. But you have not told me who will take your place. Right? So what is Moses trying to do? He's trying to say, God, I'm affirming you. There's no one like you. And if you don't go with us, I just don't know. I just don't know I'm going to make this happen. But I want you. 
Can you tell me who will go with me if not you? Now, do you understand what Moses is trying to say to God? He's trying to say indirectly, please go with me. <laughs> you have not told me whom you, whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. God, you said that, remember? Remember when you pray to God, remind him of his promises. Remind him. Because he cannot turn away from his own word. Next verse. So what we're learning, affirm God. Number two, remind him of his promises. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. Now he's praying in God's interest, right? If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways. He's saying, Lord, I don't need another person. I don't need another partner. I need you. You are the one who will teach me your ways, not somebody else. You got this point? Teach me your ways so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people, Lord. Your people. You told me whom you brought out. Lord, change your pronoun. Wrong. Your people. <laughs> Are you smiling? This is how you talk with God. Especially when, God, especially when God's really upset. He said, Lord, remember... These are your people, not mine. Truth check. <laughs> what did God say to Moses? Lead these people whom you brought out of Egypt. He was so angry. And remember, said, remember this as your people, not mine. You understand that? But teach me your ways. Lord, I have no better friend than you. You are my God, and you're not going with us. Lord, teach, if you find favor with you, teach me your ways, that I may know you. You know, in short, please come with us. Pero magaling si Moses in negotiating with God, right? Are you learning something from Moses? Next verse. The Lord replied, <laughs> Ang Diyos bumigay agad, di ba? But interesting, you won't see the significance unless you know the original language. My presence will go with you singular. Okay, Moses. I'll be your friend. I'll, be, go, I'll go with you singular, but not with them. Okay? I will go with you and I will give you singular rest. I'm not saying for them. If you're a Moses, you say, Lord, that's it, deal. Did Moses stop with that? Look at the next verse. He would, not say, he would want God just to go with him personally. He said, then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. I'll be with you, Moses, you alone. No, Lord, if you don't go with us, do not send us out from here. Amen? Not the next verse. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Look, God, you want to go with me? Sorry, it's buy one, take one. I want take one. If you want to go with me, you better go with us. Because who will, you know, how can, what else will distinguish me and your people? Me and your people are already one. So Lord, please don't send, go with me without going with us. Because you have to buy one and take one. Okay? Can you see the heart of Moses for the people? He, Moses refuses to enjoy privilege at the expense of the people. Can you say that with me? Leaders refuse to enjoy privilege at the expense of the people. Let me repeat that. Leaders will refuse to enjoy privilege at the expense of the people. You understand that principle of leadership? You understand that? Okay. Next verse. 
And the Lord said to Moses, Ah, finally, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Breakthrough! Moses knows how to negotiate with God. He affirmed God, right? He reminded him of his promise. He reminded him of his own words. These are your people whom you brought out of Egypt. Truth check, Lord. <laughs> and fourthly, he wanted to know him more, which pleases God so much. You know what is the greatest hunger of God from you? Is to know him more. Because unless you know him more, you cannot really love him more. And you cannot trust him enough to obey him if you do not know him enough. Can you say to the person beside you, if you don't know God enough, you won't trust him enough to obey him enough. And you won't love him enough. Enough said. <laughs> you understand that? That's why when Moses said, that I may know you. Wow. In the heart of God is like, Glory! The longing of God is to be known. That's why He revealed Himself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He revealed Himself on Mount Sinai. He revealed Himself through Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Jesus Christ came to reveal the Father. That's what He said. The heart of the Father is to make Himself known. And the, the greatest thing He wants you to do is to know Him. That's the essence of the relationship God wants with you. You will know Him, so you will love Him, so you will obey Him. Are you still here? You understand this? How much do you know your God? Every time you doubt and worry, you don't know your God. Every time you hesitate to obey God, you don't know your God. Every time you doubt His promise, you do not know your God. Every time you feel like, you know, you don't want to follow God because it's so hard or difficult because you don't love Him enough, it's because you don't know your God. Everything begins with knowing God. Do you understand this? That's in Hosea, the, you know, the Lord said, My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge of me. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge of their, their God. Do you understand this? That's why when Moses said, that I may know you. You know, I can imagine the heart of God just boom, leaping with joy. That's what I want to hear. And after Moses said that, God said, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you. Why? Because your heart's desire is to know me. I'll give you anything you ask. Do you understand this? Do you know why you, your life with God is so like, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down? Do you know why? We want to know why your Christian life is like. You trust God, then you doubt Him. You trust God, then you doubt Him. You obey God, and then you don't obey Him. Do you know why? You don't know Him enough to worship Him enough, to love Him enough, to trust Him enough. That's why the heart of God was so stirred when he heard that I may know you. That was the magic word. I'm going to do the very thing you ask because I am pleased with you and I know you. You see, I know you by name. And what pleases me is that you want to know my name. Do you understand this? Jesus said in John 17, this is eternal life. To know you, the one true God and to know the one whom you have sent, that's Jesus. Jesus said, eternal life is this, to know you, the true God. That is eternal life. Do you understand this? Okay? And so, God finally said, yes. But this time, Lord, please let me go over and see the land. Enough! Do not talk about this with me anymore. Wow. This time, all this negotiation did not work anymore. God was fully decided. Amen? But listen to this. When God closes a door, 
Send us because of your fault, because you have offended God. Sometimes God will close the door. But listen to this. If you just continue trusting God, if you repent of what you have done, even though He closed a door, one day He will open a gate, not a window. God is not a God of diminishing returns. He is a progressive God. When He closes a door, He opens a gate. But you have to trust and obey. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to show that you trust Him and you're turning away from your wrong ways and you want to show obedience to God. That's going to touch the heart of God. You know what was the gate for Moses? He never entered the land on earth. He never saw it. God took his life before Joshua led Israel into the promised land. But he never got into the promised land. Okay? Some of you already know what happened after, right? Who knows what happened after? Did Moses step in the land? Yes! He died before Joshua led Israel to the promised land. But when Jesus came onto earth, he was on the mountain. And the glory of God was unleashed in his body, in his whole body, you know, uh, blazed with light. And a cloud came down, reminding of the cloud of Moses, the cloud in which Moses entered into Mount Sinai when he talked with God, the cloud that will come down on the tent of meeting, and Moses will talk with God. That was the cloud that reminds you of the Shekinah glory of God in the Old Testament through which God spoke with Moses. And the Moses descended upon them, and Simon, James, and John, these three fishermen, so Moses and Elijah appear on the right and the left of Jesus as the, mount, the cloud was coming down. Like in Mount Sinai, it was, this was a mountain and there was a huge cloud. Mount Horeb, a huge cloud. It was like Mount Sinai again. The cloud descended and out of the cloud came the voice, This is my son, hear him. And who was standing on his right and his left? Moses and, and Elijah, and they were, Moses was standing on the land of Israel with the Son of God. Wow. Now, which is better? Go into the land with God just, you know, up there, or step on the land with the Son of God Himself, talking about His coming death on the cross. Because that death of Christ will redeem Moses from his failure in the Old Testament. But because Jesus will be the manifestation of God's grace, and who will be the one to pay the price of all the sins of all humanity, including Moses' sin, then the coming of Christ meant redemption also for Moses. Amen? But see, Moses had to wait for more than 2,000 years to finally get into the land. Amen? Okay? So can you say to the person beside you, even though something may seem impossible, when God shows you favor, nothing is impossible. Amen? He just wants you to obey Him and to trust Him. He wants you to know Him. That's the heart of God. Amen? And so let's go on with our outline. So Moses was denied. And so what happens now? We're going to learn some important truths about Joshua. Moses was about to be succeeded by Joshua. Can we say succession? Always the most difficult thing experienced for a leader is that one day somebody will take his place. Okay? Succession has something to do with preparing the way for another one to take your place because God has something else for you. You understand this? Now, the principle of mentoring. Every great leader prepares for succession from the start. Moses chose Joshua to be his assistant, according to Numbers, from his youth. In the way, from the very beginning of Moses' ministry, 
among the, sla the Jewish, the Israelite slaves in Egypt, he already got to know Joshua and called him to be his assistant. So jo Joshua was the assistant of Moses for the 40 years that they spent in the wilderness. Somebody who will absorb his vision, his passion, his character, who will absorb everything that God put into him, was being prepared in the one who one day will succeed him. Do you understand this? That's why Jesus Christ, when he started his public ministry, the first thing he did was to choose 12. At the beginning of his ministry, not at the end. Do you understand this? Okay? Because he has to mentor the successors for three years, so that by the time they take his place, they know exactly the vision, the mission, and the goals. The BMG of Jesus Christ. Do you understand this? Okay? That is why, if you are a leader, you should always recognize you will not be there forever. And if you do not find someone, if you do not qualify someone to take your place, when you are gone, what will happen to the work that God has entrusted to you? You understand that? That is why succession is very important to leadership. You don't plan it at the last minute because that will be too late. There's no, there will be no more time for the mentoring, the transfer of life to another life. You cannot transfer a life to another in a short period of time. Amen? You can only transfer it in a process of time. That's why you need to have people working with you. You work as a team and you begin to transfer life to them. So that later on, they will be able to effectively carry out the work when you're gone. And they will still be successful. Because you reproduce yourself in your successor. Do you understand this? How many of you have businesses here? Can you raise your hands, please? Always the challenge of every business person is who will take over the company when you leave this life. Do you understand that? If you're going to wait until you're sick and about to die, it will be too late to make the right choice. Right? If you're a businessman, you need to train someone now while you're still strong and healthy. While you're at the prime of your life, train someone who later on can take over the business when you're gone because you have to recognize you won't be there forever. And what happens to your business if it is taken over by somebody who is incompetent and unqualified because you prepared to qualify your successor? Amen? Enduring success is assured by successful succession management. Enduring success of any company, any organization, and even a church Enduring success is guaranteed by proper succession management. I have seen even Christian companies, Christian organizations in the Philippines who because of the wrong transfer of succession, the wrong person took over. In time, the organization went down and had to close ministry. Because the one who took the place of the visionary who started the organization was not, was not able to experience an impartation of that vision and passion and the, and the, the, that was in the leader, the one who started it. It was not imparted properly to the next line of leadership. That's why the next line of leadership operated the company their way, by their beliefs, by their conviction, and so boom, it goes down. You understand this? As well as enemies, that's why I do not work alone. I have a team in the church, the pastoral council. I have the board with me. And I told them, I am accountable to you. And I thank God they've been faithfully correcting me at certain points. Do you understand this? And I have to share my life with them. It takes a leader to be a channel of God to meet specific needs in the world. Amen? So that is why the question the is mentoring. Are you mentor? Are you, if you are a leader, are you mentoring someone now, like Paul mentored Timothy and Jesus mentored 12 apostles? And here we are, Moses has mentored Joshua, who later on will take your place in time when the Lord sends you home. Are you mentoring now? 
You better make the choice before it's too late. Do you understand that? Another principle, I go quickly. Joshua's convictions and character were molded by a great mentor and model, and that's Moses. If you're a leader, you need a mentor. Can I say that? We need a mentor. Unless you believe you know everything that needs to be known about leadership alone. Every great leader has been mentored by a leader. And sometimes the one who mentored rises up to be greater than the mentor in times. But the common experience that the mentoree rises up only to the level of the mentor. But there are some exceptions. Some have risen up higher than their mentors. Do you understand this? How many of you are leaders here? Business leaders, church leaders, organizational leaders? Okay. Let me ask you this. Who is mentoring you? Who is mentoring you? To whom are you accountable? Because you know you're not perfect. Right? You need somebody to correct you, remind you, guide you. To whom are you accountable? This is one of the most important questions for leadership. To whom are you accountable? The lack of accountability often leads to compromises in the life of a leader because it's not accountable to anyone. And without accountability, integrity is almost impossible to build. As a leader, the most important character trait must be integrity. Because once integrity is gone, people won't follow you anymore because they don't believe in you anymore. The integrity of your life is central and integral to your leadership. But it's very difficult to maintain integrity if you have no accountability with anyone. Do you understand this? Okay? That is why I'm asking you, who is your mentor? You better find one. Okay? Why mentoring? Because influence. A mentor influences the mentoree. With his convictions, his character, his vision, his passion, is transferred into the life of the mentor. Do you understand this? That's why I decided to have three big groups, strategically among leaders in the church, because it's time for me to transfer all that God put into me to others, to multiply myself, because I'm finding it more and more difficult to operate alone. Very hard, okay? So, the principle of influence. That's why. Joshua would never leave the tent because he was so influenced by Moses' heart of worship. He became a passionate worshiper himself. That's in Exodus 33, 11. In Numbers 32, 9 to 12, it said there that Joshua and Caleb were the only two men of their generation that remained alive after 40 years because God said, because they followed God wholeheartedly. And who was the, the mentor of Joshua? Moses. And he saw how Moses followed God wholeheartedly and that influenced him to follow God wholeheartedly also. You understand this? Dedication is very difficult to maintain if you don't have a model to show you an example of dedication. You understand this? You see, the commitment of the mentor, his loyalty will transfer to the mentor. To the disciple. And that's exactly what Joshua experienced. He followed God wholeheartedly. That's why God spared his life and he entered the promised land as Israel's leader because he followed God wholeheartedly because he was under the mentorship of a man named Moses who followed God wholeheartedly. Do you hear this? Okay? But let me tell you this. Moses was not perfect. You agree? Because he failed God at Kadesh Barnea, where he struck the rock twice instead of speaking to the rock, and God said, because of what you've done, you will not enter the land. Are you still here? Did Joshua see that? Of course. He was Moses' assistant. He's always with Moses all the time. So what do you think Joshua learned? Never compromise God's commands. You cannot know better than God. Don't argue with God. Don't negotiate with Him. Our duty is to obey, not to negotiate, so it's done my way. You follow it. You follow God's way. Amen? Do not compromise. So Joshua learned that. You know why? Because throughout the story of Joshua, in the book of Joshua, listen to this, 
you have you will never see Joshua compromising God's command at all his leadership proved to be greater in terms of character than Moses did never compromise God's commands because he learned his lesson from his mentor amen mentors are not perfect people they are not gods they make mistakes but even then you can learn from your mentor and avoid what your mentor did you understand this okay so he was principle of influence and third secondly the influence principle impartation can you show Deuteronomy 34 verse 9 when you are always being influenced by a mentor listen to this listen carefully the gifts that God gave your mentor will gradually be imparted to you can you say this you call this impartation can you say impartation now Joseph son of Dan was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him so they said listen to him and did what the Lord had God commanded where did the wisdom come from the laying of hands is transfer of something that you have to another person did Moses know wisdom in his leadership that wisdom that Moses possessed from God when he laid his hands was transferred to Joshua you understand the spirit of wisdom that was with Moses was now with Joshua that is why you need a mentor and you need to choose a mentor whom you know has a vision of God in his life you need a mentor whom you know demonstrates the example of character and integrity that will embolden and reinforce yours because whatever gifts God has given him will gradually be imparted to you as you submit to your mentor do you understand this remember Joshua is very submissive to Moses that's why in the end his wisdom transferred to Moses do you understand this okay can you say to the person beside you the key is submission to your mentor your mentor will not be perfect amen but there's much that he will impart to you go back to our outline let's close not only did Joshua had a mentor and a model that influenced and gave him impartation he received full support from God Moses and the people okay no leader can succeed without the encouragements of God your mentor and the people you will be serving amen pastor Dave needs your encouragement I'm always the one encouraging you guys so let me tell you no I also get discouraged okay the beautiful thing is that God gave Joshua an encouragement network okay Deuteronomy 3 28 31 7 to 8 Moses encouraged him be strong and courageous God said to Moses encourage and strengthen Joshua you're a mentor as a mentor your job Moses is to encourage and strengthen your successor amen can you say encourage and strengthen okay you need to be encouraged and strengthened by a mentor okay secondly he was encouraged by God himself God said to Moses okay call Joshua I will commission him so he told Moses commission Joshua but God later said okay call Joshua I will commission him wow double commissioning he was commissioned by Moses by God's command but God was not satisfied with that he said I will commission him tell him I will commission him he said be strong you're going to lead these people I will be with you wow powerful God encourages Joshua and finally in Joshua 1 16 to 18 the people say go Joshua we will obey you we will submit to you we will do everything you command nobody's going to turn to the left and right we will obey you completely just be strong and courageous what an encouragement so what is the greatest encouragement that people can give to a leader everybody's quiet suddenly what is the greatest encouragement a people can give to their leader we will obey you we will follow you amen we're not going to make the ministry a burden for you we will cooperate with you 
Be strong and be courageous. That's what the people said to Joshua. Everything you say, we will do. You understand this? Amen? Amen? Do you have leaders that you're serving? The greatest encouragement you can give to them is say, I'll, I'll submit to you. I'll obey you. You understand that? I'll support you. I'll cooperate with you. That's your greatest encouragement to your leader. Amen? Encouraged by the people. It's not easy to be a leader. The price may be high, but the rewards are greater than the price. Let me bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the challenge of leadership. You have called us all to be leaders because you have called us to be light to the people around us. And Father, we pray that like Joshua, may we seek a mentor in our lives. May we seek to be mentored and we will learn submission to our mentor. To recognize, O oh God, that it is your desire that whatever you have given to the leader will be imparted to those that are being led. So that the succession of your wonderful work will continue through time because of the impartation of one life to another through the generations. Father, we pray that we will have the humility to make ourselves accountable. We have the humility to submit to those above us, to those whom we work with, so that you can mold in us those qualities that will make us leaders with enduring success. And thank you, Lord, for reminding us of your promises today. And we give you honor and glory for speaking to us. Lord, we will obey. We will follow you. And Lord, our prayer is, let me know you. Cause me to know you, Father. I want to know you more. For I know this is your heart's desire. So that I will learn to really love you more, and obey you more, and trust you more. Lord, give me the commitment to really know you. Because that's what pleases you the most. What honors you the most, what glorifies you the most, is that we are knowing you. For this is our prayer, in Jesus' name.